Hi everybody and welcome back to I Am Journal Club. Today we're talking about an issue on everybody's minds, vitamin D supplementation. There's a new study out in the New England Journal that suggests that vitamin D supplementation doesn't do anything to prevent fractures in a healthy population. And to break this all down, I'm talking to one of my dear HMU colleagues, Dr. Wood Yang Fein, who is also an endocrinologist focusing on bone health. And since he's the fracture liaison at Mass General Hospital seeing patients with new fractures, he is the perfect person to talk to. So let's jump right in. Dr. Fan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ben, for having me. So before we begin, I would like to ask you a personal question as an endocrinologist focusing on bone health and also yeah. working as a fracture liaison uh, in the hospital. What does it give you to work with patients and relatives who experience a care gap, who should be maybe on a certain treatment, but aren't. What does that personally give you? Oh, yeah. So that's a such a good question. And uh, one of the main reasons I'm doing this uh, type of work. So, uh, Ben, as you know, that the, um, you know, the patient who has suffered a hip fracture actually have a mortality probably two to three times higher than having a, a STEMI. And unfortunately, uh, only a small fraction of uh, uh, those patients actually uh, are receiving appropriate uh, uh, treatment. And so that was one of the um, you know, uh, motivation that I uh, and, uh, was able to gain over the past uh, many years. And I found that's very rewarding to me. So I'm really... Uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, interested or motivated in uh, doing this uh, type of work. I think uh, that is, uh, you know, a fascinating position to be in. Next, uh, I will summarize the results. So we'll insert that here and then we'll go on and I'll ask you the, the first question, okay? The vitamin D and omega-3 trial of VITAL was a randomized placebo-controlled trial of colloidal cifero, that's vitamin D3, and omega-3 fatty acids. Since they tested two interventions, this was studied in a 2x2 two two factorial design. Vitamin D was given as 2,000 units daily, and the daily omega-3 pills contained 1 gram of fatty acids. This was an ancillary study of a trial that is hypothesized to test whether these interventions alone or together can prevent cancer or cardiovascular disease. The study population is men over 50 and women over 55 years of age. There were no other in or exclusive criteria except that participants could not already have cancer or cardiovascular disease and also they couldn't have hypertensemia. The resulting study published had a mean age of 67, 50, 51% were female, they were recruited entirely in the US and they had 71% Caucasians and 20% African Americans. Notably, it was allowed that patients were already taking vitamin D supplements and 43% already did so. 5% were also taking osteoporosis medications and 10% had a previous uh, fragility fracture. The baseline mean vitamin D level was over 30 nanograms per milliliter. Over the course of the median 5.3 years of follow-up, vitamin D did not prevent fractures in the total fracture group. The same was true for non-vertebral and hip fracture subgroups, but there were other subgroups that we will doctor, ask Dr. Fan about in a little bit. Um, I know hindsight is 2020, but uh, before the vital results were published, did you or other endocrinologists uh, expect that this was going to be a positive trial so that vitamin D uh, does prevent fractures in the general population? Uh, well, uh, not necessarily. Uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, over the past uh, couple of decades, I would say by now, there are many uh, different uh, type of uh, um, studies uh, uh, who focused on vitamin D alone or uh, together with the calcium supplementation and whether or not this uh, you know, treatment, so to speak, can uh, um, uh, prevent a fracture, uh, either primary or, or secondary on a secondary basis. And, uh, and some study is quite positive and many studies are not. 
and even including a few studies showing possible harmful effect. So um, I think, uh, the, you know, the, in a general uh, healthy population, um, many people would expect probably, you know, supplement of some vitamin D uh, very less likely to have a dramatic effect especially if you choose a fracture as the end point of the study. So Vidal studied a general population of middle-aged or older patients, um, and the mean 25 hydroxy vitamin D level was 31 uh, nanogram per milliliter, while only 30, 13% of participants had less than 20 nanogram per milliliter. However, even in that subgroup, I mean, under 20, which was uh, 2,100 patients big, so not insubstantial, um, there was no effect. Do you think vitamin D supplementation to prevent fractures uh, in, uh, might work in those uh, only who have a vitamin D uh, deficiency, uh, taking these results into account? Uh, yeah, so that's a, such an important uh, question about this study. If you look at the baseline and 25 hydroxy vitamin D level of the study subject, it's actually, you know, 30 uh, uh, nanogram per deciliter, which is a, a very robust level, which is actually considered as optimal level. And, and I think a post-treatment level is, uh, you know, in the one of the group, it, it, it demonstrates that the level is 40. So we're talking about the otherwise the healthy um, patient with a quite the robust baseline level, and you further increased from 30 to 40 to see whether or not within the four to five years of follow-up to see if you have any uh, benefit in terms of uh, uh, fracture risk reduction. Uh, so that's what we are looking at. And the conclusion is that what we don't, we didn't really see, uh, see any substantial effect. So that's probably fairly reasonable or expected. Now, the key question will be in the subgroup of vitamin D deficient, and do you expect a, uh, a effect uh, in this particular group? And I think, uh, to me, um, this study uh, is great, but I don't think it uh, is adequately addressed the question, that question yet, as Dr. Uh, Leboff and other authors has uh, uh, very specifically stated in the paper. It says that the study this study is not recruited uh, based on vitamin D deficiency status, uh, and, uh, and the and data may not be in, in generalized uh, to subject with vitamin D deficiency or osteoporosis or osteopenia. And that's, that's very clearly uh, and, and actually rather carefully uh, stated in the, the, the discussion, I think. That's that. Now, when we look at the actual data presented in the in the paper, and I think is a, a table three, the last session there is a quartile. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they separate the patient to uh, four quartile, and then and then look at the uh, uh, the fracture uh, uh, events in each group. And uh, if you look at the data. Uh, carefully, you will, you know, really find it quite interesting that the, uh, the quarter one, which is defined uh, by uh, vitamin D level less than 24 nanogram per uh, milliliter, uh, actually has uh, had the lowest uh, uh, percent, you know, risk of fracture or, or, or percentage of uh, fracture. And I think it 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 is uh, I think it's five point two percent if you look at the baseline uh, or the proceed among the in the placebo group. And then as uh, the vitamin D level uh, goes higher uh, in the placebo group, you surprisingly notice that the, the fracture uh, uh, risk is actually going higher. So that the, in quarter four, which is defined. Uh, by vitamin D level of greater than 37, the baseline uh, risk uh, uh, fracture percentage is 8.9%. So, so, so that is quite unusual to think about because you have a special population where a higher 
vitamin D level at the baseline actually has a higher risk of fracture. So, so, so the only possible explanation for that is that uh, this uh, uh, subject uh, of a high or quad high or quad high three or quad four probably uh, have some risk at baseline, the risk for vitamin D deficiency or risk for uh, whatever bone health problem. And they are very likely already taking some vitamin D. Uh, and uh, as uh, very specifically stated in the study, uh, it's also stated that, uh, you know, baseline uh, vitamin D or non-trial uh, vitamin D supplementation is allowed uh, in the study. So, uh, so I think that makes things a little bit more complicated. So uh, going back to your question, uh, I'm on patient with vitamin D deficiency, let's say quarter one, is just, uh, just people with, with less than 20, uh, 24 uh, nanogram per deciliter. They are not taking it, they, uh, they probably represent a relatively healthy or, or a population in a, a subgroup in this study population. So if you want to start a population with relatively you know, healthier status and otherwise really not at risk. And you give them uh, vitamin D and trying to raise it to, you know, it is for, uh, give, uh, give 2000 units of vitamin D uh, for uh, four to five years and trying to look at any point of fracture, that might be hard. You know, let's say if we have any point for bone density change over time or bone turnover markers uh, over time, that may be different. So my take is that uh, at least from this uh, result, uh, I will not necessarily conclude that uh, even among vitamin D deficient uh, uh, people, uh, vitamin D supplementation uh, will have no effect. It's probably a little bit premature to conclude that even from this uh, you know, study uh, results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then in, in that subgroup of vitamin D deficient patients, uh, um, they had a, a threshold of under 12 nanograms per milliliter. They only had a combined uh, 400 participants in each group, vitamin D and placebo, and 15 events. Uh, what do you think that's an adequate threshold to look for an effect? Uh, and therefore, the study might be underpowered or uh, would you actually take a higher cutoff in terms of uh, an expected benefit? Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, 400 people uh, over four to five years, and in order to, you know, observe a difference of any point such as uh, fracture, uh, that might be, uh, I don't think it's statistically uh, powerful enough in that very special population. That's my take. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the United States Preventive uh, Services Task Force said uh, that in the general population, uh, they do uh, recommend against vitamin D dose below 400 uh, milligrams plus less than 100 milligrams uh, of calcium um, in uh, postmenopausal women. And there was insufficient evidence uh, in men or women for higher doses. Um, and that uh, in asymptomatic community dwelling non-pregnant adults, there was also insufficient evidence uh, to screen for vitamin D deficiency. Given these uh, new results, uh, including that subgroup that we just talked about, um, do you think there might not be enough uh, evidence now to, uh, to continue recommend against uh, screening? Uh, or do you think we just need more evidence? Yeah, so that's a, such a, a, um, a great question. And I think, uh, you know, to me, after I reading this two, uh, this, this, this paper, uh, I, I think there are, you know, a lot of, uh, again, there are still a lot of controversy uh, there. Um, but the, uh, to me, at least there are two um, quite clear uh, points uh, that uh, is not controversial anymore. And one of them is, uh, is probably, uh, you know, the main conclusion of this study, uh, which is that, uh, uh, you know, among uh, otherwise quite a healthy uh, uh, population, 
and you uh, you know already have uh, adequate uh, vitamin D to begin with, and then on top of that, uh, giving you two thousand unit a, a day for four to five years probably will not do anything um, more beneficial additionally. And so otherwise, the healthy um, uh, general population, I think the people are fairly. And you know, uh, agreeable that we don't have evidence to uh, do population uh, screening. Uh, you already mentioned uh, the uh, USPS PF's uh, um, uh, position, and I think the Endocrine Society uh, has a pretty similar uh, stance. And their statement is that the uh, population screening, uh, not at risk uh, population, right? The, the general population screening or screening of those not at the risk is contraindicated. That's the, uh, uh, the, the professional society's statement. So I think that's quite clear, and that is not to, uh, with much controversial that the, uh, you know, uh, in general population, uh, there's no uh, recommendation to, to do uh, screening for the general population. And then what about uh, non-community uh, dwelling uh, uh, individuals, uh, say uh, nursing home residents who don't get any exercise and maybe also less sunlight? Um, could you comment on outside of this trial whether they, in your personal opinion, should uh, receive uh, supplementation or if um, they should have a vitamin D level check first and that should uh, guide you? Uh, or if you can just go straight to supplementation uh, and maybe not just with vitamin D, but vitamin D plus calcium? Uh, yeah, so that's a, such a, a good question. And uh, actually, you know, and, and the author of this paper have laid out a very specific comment for that. In, in, the, in the discussion session, they laid out very clearly that the, the, this study results should not or may not be generalized to uh, people who are uh, institutionalized, uh, so to speak, you know, in rehab or nursing home present. So I think in the, in, you know, I'm an endocrinologist, so I follow the endocrine studies guideline. So they, they do uh, uh, recommend to check vitamin D level and, uh, for so-called at-risk population, uh, which, uh, you know, a lot of time will include uh, you know, uh, uh, elderly people who are uh, in a nursing home, otherwise, you know, do not have sunlight, or, or especially if their diet is also uh, quite deficient in terms of vitamin D and calcium. I think I will, uh, you know, if you see a, in any an obvious risk, uh, and me personally will prefer to, to check it. And the, and usually, I think it's always a good idea if you want to do uh, give supplementation or give treatment. Uh, in general, it's probably a good idea to have a number uh, um, to to guide your 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 proposed uh, intervention. Because if if uh, let's say the you know they don't have sunlight exposure, but if their diet is already have uh, adequate uh, vitamin D in it, uh, you may not necessarily uh, need to give them actual pills. Understood. So you, Dr. Fan, personally would propose to first check a level and not go straight to supplementation? I will probably do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So going back to the study, um, in, in vital, there was a signal uh, hazard ratio for fractures of 0.74 or but with a very wide confidence interval for another subgroup of patients, uh, those already on osteoporotic uh, medications. And then there was another, maybe somewhat smaller signal for pa patients with previous fragility uh, fractures. Uh, in an interview, the authors mentioned that uh, they think the subgroups, these two subgroups are large enough to make conclusions about them. About uh, the, the the study overall uh, looked at a general healthy middle aged and older uh, population without uh, known osteoporosis or even osteopenia. Um, so, what do you make of these uh, statements? Do do you uh, do you agree with the authors that uh, these subgroups should also not be supplement supplemented, or do you think um, there is enough evidence, or there needs to be further studies? Uh, yeah. So, I think you are talking about. Uh subgroup analysis uh, presented in table three. So there are two uh, uh, additional very uh, important subgroup analysis, uh, you know, uh, namely the, the people 
uh, with a history of fragility fracture, number one. And number two, is people have, have known osteoporosis and is on uh, uh, osteoporosis uh, medications. Uh, and if you, if you look at, well, first of all, again, I would uh, want to put uh, the author's uh, uh, you know, statement in, in, in the in discussion uh, session in that uh, this study uh, you know, should not, may not be generalized to uh, adults with osteoporosis or osteomalacia. So uh, that's, a, that's a, um, uh, their own uh, statement, which I found very appropriate. Now, when you look at the data and the, uh, you know, these two subgroups. Uh, so first I would say that the, uh, uh, as you already mentioned, the, uh, confidence, the confidence interval is almost a crossing one, right? Uh, yeah, if you compare those two groups with all other subgroup analysis, uh, those two groups will probably uh, have this CI that's most across of crossing one. So suggesting that uh, there's a very likely a clinical significance, may not, not necessarily you know, statistical significance from this, this study group. But uh, I think I, when I look at this data, me personally have two uh, main concerns when I look at this data. Number one, even for people, for, for the subgroup of people, who are giving vitamin D uh, uh, replacement, uh, we do not know uh, the pre-treatment uh, level and the post-treatment level. So let's see um, if the pre-treatment level is the average uh, study population level, which you study. And if that's the case, you know, and if you raise the, the pre-treatment level from 30 to, to, uh, to even to 40 and maintain that for four or five years, and if you want to see a uh, you know, significant reduction of a uh, fracture risk, that might be hard. So that, that's why I do not see a baseline level and uh, the delta value in the change of, of, the, of the vitamin D level among those groups. So that's number one concern. And number two concern is that uh, in the follow-up time, you know, the population 2000 summer is not very large. To, uh, I would think, and two, you know, the follow-up duration is uh, four to five years. Uh, so you know, when we clinically see a patient with osteopenia or any uh, with other risk factors, we do the flux, you know, uh, calculation. And the flux calculation is always 10 years risk. You're talking about a 10, risk, 10 years risk for hip fracture, 10 years risk for uh, osteop major osteoporotic fracture. So I, I would think, uh, you know, with a, even with this short duration, and uh, in, um, you have a uh, confidence interval almost crossing one, to me, it, it does not, the data uh, does not exclude uh, the possible clinical uh, um, significance uh, or efficacy of vitamin D plus uh, uh, calcium, uh, you know, in these two uh, subgroups. That's, that's my personal take. Um, I'm glad you bring up calcium. Uh, in, in previous research, including in three meta-analyses, there was no effect of vitamin D on all fractures, um, um, vitamin D by itself. Um, but there was an effect in osteoporotic women. Uh, however, there was an effect um, on osteoporotic women of vitamin D plus uh, calcium. Uh, as well as calcium by itself. Calcium supplementation is, of course, controversial because of its potential cardiovascular effects. But what do you make of uh, these results? Is there currently equipoise for studying the incremental effect of vitamin D on top of calcium? Uh, yeah, so that's a, such a uh, good question. Uh, but if we go back to uh, you know, um, basic biology about the vitamin D, is, uh, again, you know, it's it's a steroid hormone. It, or it, it works by uh, binding and activating vitamin D receptor. Uh, the receptor will, uh, will form a heterodimer with Rx and then trigger the downstream gene expression, etc. Uh, and, and so, one of the uh, many biological effects is uh, in the in in the gut, in the intestine, to uh, to facilitate. Uh, calcium uh, uh, absorption. 
and so so that if you um, do not have a functional vitamin D receptor, let's say in animal you can uh, genetically manipulate this and knock it out, or in human beings there's a rare uh, condition that the, where you have vitamin D receptor uh, loss of functional mutation. So among those uh, animals or, or uh, uh, human beings, uh, they can have a very uh, profound uh, osteomalacia or, uh, you know, uh, this type of issue, hypocalcemia. Now, uh, this uh, hypocalcemia and osteomalacia can be uh, corrected, actually, by just giving a lot of uh, calcium uh, load to their GI system. So, so what I'm trying to say is that vitamin D uh, uh, will facilitate the absorption uh, uh, of calcium from stomach system, uh, but not necessarily, you know, it's a, it's a, a essential, you know. So, uh, so that probably is a biological basis for uh, about the, the vitamin D plus minus uh, uh, calcium and their biological effect of uh, their clinical effect in terms of uh, 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 risk of reduction of, of fracture. So, if uh, we have a, uh, I have a summary of uh, many of the uh, prior studies of uh, uh, vitamin D uh, plus minus uh, calcium and their effect on uh, primary uh, risk, uh, you know, fracture prevention. And the data is uh, quite uh, controversial. Uh, and, the, uh, and I think one of the main um, um, confounder of those uh, prior studies is probably precisely as you mentioned, whether or not you have uh, calcium in it, uh, in your regimen. So I would be happy to uh, provide the list of, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the list of the of different studies and different uh, outcomes. But uh, one of the uh, uh, most convincing um, study uh, to me is really the Women's Health uh, Initiative uh, mm -hmm. study. And that study, uh, you know, it, it followed uh, 36,000 postmenopausal women for 10 years. And they found that uh, for those women who take uh, uh, 400 uh, international units per day of vitamin D, along with uh, up to 1,000 milligram of elemental calcium a day, uh, did have up to 29% uh, risk reduction of hip fracture, but uh, this effect is observed only among uh, those people who uh, took the, 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 the vitamin plus calcium 80% uh, of the time or more. So if you are mm -hmm. consistently from this very large uh, scale uh, study uh, for, for decades, then I think, you know, they, they, they did show a signal. To me, that's quite a a, a, a most convincing study to me. Um, and then, of course, there's also potential downsides from vitamin D supplementation. It might cause weakness uh, or even uh, falls. Yeah, so that is very true. As I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, or not the very beginning, <laughs> in the middle of our discussion, that to me, there are two um, uh, quite clear signal from this study. Uh, that the, uh, there was no controversial. Number one, we already mentioned that in general population, we, we don't need to uh, screen. I, I think uh, very little controversy about that uh, by now. Uh, the, the second conclusion that to me, uh, it's no longer controversial is that uh, taking vitamin D at 2000 units a day, you know, otherwise healthy population is safe. And this is a very important signal uh, or conclusion from this study, I think. We all agree that uh, when, uh, when we practice medicine, the first and the most important principle we'll follow is that first you don't do harm. So uh, taking 2,000 units a day uh, in a general, otherwise uh, healthy general population uh, will not do you any harm from this study and along uh, uh, prior studies. So that's a very uh, important piece of information. I think this study delivers, and I think it will provide a lot of peace of mind to many people who are on this uh, vitamin D. So, uh, so, so that's great. Uh, uh, now, uh, precisely as you mentioned, uh, there is a special setting that uh, vitamin D supplementation can be harmful. Uh, so those studies are all, you know, um, 
uh, fairly old by now, but this, this, the signal is quite, the, the message is quite clear, is that if you want to give large, uh, very large um, uh, bolus dose to, to, uh, to uh, people, especially elderly people, then you may potentially uh, increase their risk of fall and a fracture. So uh, the, a study many years ago by Dr. Smith, et cetera, uh, they, they trying to give uh, once a year uh, intramuscular injection at 3,000 units each time and to the uh, people who are residing in nursing home, uh, you know, with a good intention to, to improve uh, 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 compliance or, you know, you don't have to take pills every day and just give you a shot once a year uh, to, to, to correct that problem. And then they, they observed that uh, among those people, the fall risk, the fracture risk actually, in, uh, you know, increased. And following that, there are study in Australia, they look at the community the world in uh, population, black people, elderly people. And uh, again, they want to give a very large uh, dose once a year, 500,000 units, uh, you know, by mouse once a year and to see what happens to this population. Again, uh, they observed uh, that the risk of having fall and fracture will be increased. Uh, so those are the extreme, uh, you know, measurement, uh, extreme intervention of vitamin D supplementation. I think nobody's doing that anymore. And uh, so what happens if you do monthly, weekly, you know, uh, is there any uh, evidence to show that they can, they can also do like this uh, risk factor? I think from the study I'm aware of, I don't see any uh, report saying that. So mm -hmm. once yearly is probably, you know, not good idea to do it. Nobody's doing it. Once monthly, I don't think that you know. There's no uh, evidence to show it's harmful, but it's probably uh, be a little bit cautious. I would think once weekly is probably safe. Once daily, as you already uh, as we already mentioned, is safe, mm -hmm. and that is a clear signal. Yeah. So last question, um, what is sort of your, what are your sort of key recommendations for the following group? And I specifically want to exclude those with uh, bone pain or simulation, malabsorption syndromes, et cetera. So postmenopausal men in general, postmenopausal women, meaning all of them, and then postmenopausal women with uh, osteoporosis. And then fourth, uh, fourthly, nursing home residents or other non-community dwelling individuals. Again, in, uh, I think one, I agree one of all this common thing that the vitamin D test should be a diagnostic test instead of a screening test. I think that statement, I, I totally agree with that. It, you know, it, so in the general population, I, I, otherwise healthy, I don't think there's any evidence to support which is screen for them. But if you um, see a, 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 a patient uh, or uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, with risks, uh, I think it's probably very fair uh, you know, to, uh, to test for it. As far as you can, you have a legitimate clinical question uh, to you know to 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 uh, to answer. That seems to be very reasonable to me. Okay, I think that's all we need. Uh, what did you think? Was there anything else you wanted to say that we should cut in, or did you get to everything you wanted to say? I just want to see one more uh, comment. Uh, I think there's probably also less or almost no controversy. Is that the Despite all this controversy, controversies about vitamin D plus uh, plus minus calcium uh, in terms of a uh, uh, fracture risk reduction, a lot of people will probably agree that the effect is probably modest at its best. It's, mm -hmm. it would, it's, they are not magical pills, that's for sure. They will not uh, dramatically uh, re uh, reduce the risk of. Uh, having fracture, uh, even you know, among uh, at risk of population, uh, so that's probably quite clear. Uh, and uh, in, uh, you know, related to that, if we uh, dealing with a patient who already have uh, osteoporosis reduction, or osteoporosis diagnosis, or already suffered uh, osteoporotic fracture, then uh, you know, the, the, the modern uh, pharmacotherapy regimen. 
and, uh, and the full osteoporosis is quite effective. And we should mm -hmm. uh, really advocate that uh, every uh, you know people who have osteoporosis should uh, be offered the opportunity to, to the opportunity to to at least evaluate the potential use of those medications. And when they are on pharmacotherapy for osteoporosis, I think in that setting, you know, uh, also gives them a vitamin D plus uh, calcium uh, is probably part of the is a treatment regimen and uh, most of people, including, uh, you know, like Dr. Rabolf uh, is, is the leading author of this paper. Uh, and she mentioned in, in the Harvard uh, uh, News interview that uh, there's, there will be uh, uh, no, not too much controversy about that. That's that's the final question, uh, final comment I'd like to make. Dr. Fan, uh, thank you so much uh, for this very interesting conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity to help me a lot as well. Here are my five takeaways from my conversation with Dr. Fan. First, vitamin D supplementation, at least without calcium, does not prevent fractures in a general middle-aged and older population. Second, vitamin D screening for a general population is likewise not recommended. Third, consider vitamin D levels in the following populations, symptomatic patients, patients with osteoporosis and or a previous fracture, and the non-community dwelling elderly. In the latter population, some people also go straight to supplementation. Fourth, when supplementing, consider calcium as well. Fifth, avoid vitamin D over supplementation as high levels may cause weakness, falls, and fractures. Thank you for watching this episode of I Am Journal Club. We hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcast and see you in the next episode.